good day. I'm Colonel Jerry Morlock, the director of the Combat Studies Institute. You're about to use a video series which our instructors have prepared for the sole purpose of improving your presentation of M610, The Evolution of Modern Warfare. We've taken care to make the course that you teach as similar to the one taught at Fort Leavenworth as possible and choose to add these tapes to your libraries in order to give you every advantage as you prepare to teach this new course. These tapes are similar to the weekly train-up sessions which we utilize to prepare our instructors here at Fort Leavenworth. My intent for the tape sessions was to provide you insights and tips on ways to approach the lessons of M610 that were not available in the instructor notes. I've drawn various instructors, military and civilian, into the sessions based upon their specific expertise and historical background. They were asked to just talk to the lesson structure and content, giving you some additional information on the historical context and differing views on how to approach the lessons. These tapes will provide you a wealth of knowledge and direction that will significantly improve your readiness to teach our new history course. One word of caution regarding how to use these training tapes. They are not designed to be substituted for your instruction during the individual lessons of the course. As instructor preparation tapes, train the training material, if you will, they are inappropriate for direct instruction to students and are not intended for that purpose. Our intent with these tapes is to improve your ability to lead the student seminars by sharing tips and advice from some highly qualified experts. The Combat Studies Institute stands ready to provide whatever additional expertise or assistance that you may require, and we've included the Institute's phone, mail, and email contact information on the tape if you should need it. Good luck with the Evolution of Modern Warfare course, and have a good time. Good day. I'm Dr. Sam Lewis with the Combat Studies Institute, and with me today are my friends and colleagues, Dr. Roger Spiller and Dr. George Gavrich. Today we'll be examining Lesson 4 on the military writings and ideas of Jomini and von Clausewitz. Up to this point, we've been examining wars, great captains, campaigns in a chronological manner. Today, we are going to um, examine two great theorists in the same lesson. We should not, however, be terrorized of uh, this endeavor. Uh, and shortly, we will examine um, the nature of theory and ways of approaching theory. Uh, Regarding how to approach teaching this two-hour block, there are not too many different options. I'll tell you what I do. I devote the first hour to Jomini and his ideas and his significance, mainly for the reason that he published first and Europe's response to his interpretation uh, was the most immediate and perhaps the most long-lasting. In the second hour, I approached the ideas uh, and works of Karl von Clausewitz, whose place uh, in military history and theory we, um, we're still dealing with, and uh, which is not entirely resolved. To put this lesson and these two men in their perspective, I would like to return to late 1815. After Napoleon has been defeated at Waterloo, which will link us to last week's lesson, and Europe's diplomats assemble in Vienna to examine what has happened and what to do about it. They conclude that the French Revolution can never happen again, and they do everything they can to ensure that that traditional disturber of the European peace, France, is never allowed to put it, never allowed to be in a position again to threaten European stability. They all agree that the changes associated with the French Revolution must stop. There will be no further change. Curious, ironic, but that's how people thought back then. That occurred in the political realm. In the military realm, it should not surprise us that men would emerge to make sense of these monumental wars 
and the great captain himself, Napoleon, and what all this signified in the art of war. But before we uh, jump into uh, the ideas and life of uh, Baron de Germany, let's uh, devote a few, uh, a few minutes to theory and its nature. Roger, would you like to address that? As uh, Sam mentioned a moment ago, um, <coughs> or at least alluded to, the reaction most instructors and students have to uh, the very mention of the word theory is to tighten up perceptibly. The biggest challenge uh, that an instructor and, uh, and uh, his or her students will have in this lesson is uh, getting over uh, theory anxiety. So for a couple of moments, uh, I'd like to talk about theory itself uh, in order to uh, give the instructor uh, uh, at least one way to, uh, one way to look at the, at the whole subject of theory. First of all, <coughs> You might begin by asking yourself, what is a theory and what uh, does a theory do? What is it and what function does it serve? Uh, and if you examine this question of theory in its, most, uh, in its most general aspect, what you'll come up with is that it is a, a system, an explanation of a general phenomenon. Uh, its function, that is to say its use, is to explain something. Now, those of us familiar with theory in the modern age always think that a theory has to be, uh, has to have the property of predicting some natural phenomenon, but it hasn't always been true. Uh, the first and foremost function of theory is to explain a phenomenon, and that is why <coughs> perhaps both uh, Baron Jomini and General von Clausewitz uh, sought to, uh, sought to uh, do their work in the early 19th century, simply to explain the phenomenon of Napoleon, which otherwise would have been mysterious to most people. Now, one of the ways I have of getting uh, my students uh, into the business of thinking about theory is to ask them to, uh, as quickly as possible, um, uh, identify uh, any theory they can think of, uh, non-military theory. It could be a scientific theory or it could be a social theory. And uh, you might be surprised at how quickly such a list develops. Immediately, you would come upon uh, theories like the theory of relativity, you come upon uh, quantum theory. Uh, uh, Darwinian theory. Uh, in the non-scientific fields, uh, someone inevitably will mention uh, Marxist theory. Uh, somebody perhaps from medicine or psychiatry and psychology would mention Freudian theory. Um, and then you can talk perhaps about uh, how each one of these uh, has held up since its inception, because that becomes an important question when you're thinking about theory at all. How is theory differentiated simply from history? The mark of a theory is that it rises, any kind of theory, is that it rises above its time and place. Otherwise, it would have no utility for you at all. Um, that is one way of, uh, of discovering for yourself whether you're in the presence of a good theory or in the presence of a theory going sour on you. Does it hold up? So Does you're, it you're, help you process So you're suggesting, uh, for one thing, that we shouldn't be terrified too much of theory. No. Because there are all no. sorts of different theories. Right. Um, and that in addition, theories have shelf lives. There's nothing sacred about a theory. If it, no, if it no longer does the job, and the job of explaining is what I'm really suggesting, if it no longer does the job, you should, without remorse, discard it immediately. Okay. So perhaps one of the things we should be looking at, not just uh, today, but through the remainder of the class, are theorists and how long their theories survive. Right. We know already that uh, that Germany's uh, theories, um, uh, his explanations of uh, Napoleonic practice survived throughout most of the 19th century. One might even argue well into the 20th century, if you look at uh, modern day conceptions of American military doctrine. Uh, we also know, for instance, instance, the Clausewitzian theory didn't catch on right away. Uh, that it wasn't until the late 19th century that it achieved a measure of some professional popularity and has gained rather steadily uh, since then. 
but always in competition with, uh, with Zerminian theory. This is a really interesting aspect of this lesson that you can uh, perhaps get your students into if they read both of the essays in the, uh, in the Parade volume on these two thinkers. I think, too, another thing to consider is people approach theory and say it's abstract and unrelated to reality. A really good theory is something that's practical and useful. One way that I like to look at uh, military theory in particular is the analogy of sports. When you look at coaches and a regular season, when they go to another season, every so often they have to go back to the basics in the sport to get the team together and develop those skills that are necessary to win on the battlefield of sports. Well, in the military profession, you have to revisit what is your profession about, what are some of the basic questions that you have to answer as you prepare to wage war. And I think military theory helps you to get at the essence of what is the profession about, key issues of what is war, what's the environment of war like, because it affects how you lead your troops, how you train them, and these are important intellectual things that need to be revisited in one's professional career. That's an interesting point, and it leads to the notion that certain theorists will have different audiences uh, for which they write, uh, which we should also address. Right. Well, let's look at the first of the theorists, Baron Jomini. Um, the first question that we should ask, or at least have the students uh, address, is who was he? What did he have to say? How much validity was there to his writings? Did it make any sense? The biography that's in the uh, in the essay in uh, in Peter Perret's volume. That's the John Shy. Yes, the John Shy essay in the Makers of Modern Strategy. Um, is uh, the organization of that essay is significant in that he, uh, the organization of his essay is essentially the organization of our session here today. He tries to provide the historical context, the general historical context that Sam began uh, the session with today. Uh, but then he talks about uh, then he talks about Jomini's biography. Uh, and he, what he is really doing there is searching that, that biography for any clues that might give him a hint uh, into, uh, into a means of understanding what Jomini had to say. So your students uh, might also uh, be directed to look at that biography to see if there's anything that would lead them to believe that uh, Jomini's thinking would have a, the outcome that it did. Uh, you can do the, exactly the same thing in, in uh, Clausewitz and indeed uh, it is done in your Clausewitz essay as well. So what are the clues then of Jomini's background and upbringing that, uh, that we might want to uh, emphasize uh, in uh, trying to understand why he wrote what he wrote and when he wrote it? Um, first, let's begin with the intellectual world in which he lived. Is there anything significant to... Well, both these men were born about the same time, weren't they? 1789, 1790. And both had lives that were shaped and dominated by the French Revolution itself. Indeed. Um, what sort of world did they live in? Um, a world in which it was still possible for someone, let's say, in in the late 1790s to know all of human knowledge if they had sufficient time and uh, access to, uh, to books. Like the founding fathers of our own nation, they, the intellectuals of the time, and I think both these men qualify, um, were supremely confident in their ability to explain the world around them and to produce theories that would predict human behavior. Or at least so explain, or at least explain, or at least explain it. it. Yeah. So uh, like our founding fathers, both these military theorists were profoundly confident men, profound in their own ability to know and predict. It was a great age of system building and theory building. People believed that knowledge that didn't seem to be related, pieces of knowledge that didn't seem to be related, one piece to the other, could be made understandable. 
that they could be related one to the other. So you take things that do not appear to belong uh, to one another and uh, put them together <coughs> and organize them in a certain way. You advance knowledge at the same time you're cataloging knowledge. This is a great age for doing all that. Um, it seemed to uh, seem to dominate all intellectual life at the turn of the century. I think it's interesting too to note that the military, the senior leaders, intellectuals could easily mingle with the civilian sector, that there was interchange of ideas across the board. People were not compartmentalized and saying, I'm a military professional and I'm only going to think about military subjects. They drew upon thought from other disciplines, other fields, which made for a richness of thought within the military field. Yeah. Military professionalism is really at a very crude state of development at this period of time. You see just just the front edges of professionalism. The first schools are being, the first military schools are being established in France and in the United States and in uh, England as well. And uh, um, but there seems to be a broad uh, uh, among uh, professional soldiers or lifelong soldiers, regular soldiers, whatever term you'd like to use, the idea that um, uh, if you possess certain qualities, not necessarily intellectual qualities, you can make a fine soldier all the same. You didn't necessarily have to think much about it. Well, that in itself suggests several ideas, doesn't it? Maybe we haven't run across any great theorists before these two, because there is not a professional group of officers who need to know these things. But, but all of a sudden there is a new <coughs> social group, professionalized officers, who need a code, who need their own journals, which Dr. Spiller has been taught, just mentioned. Um, Germany himself is of profound significance just for this reason because he basically established the vocabulary that armies use to this day. Correct. Mass, lines of operation, centers of gravity. Uh, he sort of codifies all that. Uh, Germany is born in Switzerland. Clausewitz is born in a small village south of Berlin. Neither one comes from the high aristocracy. They come from basically middle class backgrounds, which may or may not be of significance. I don't know. Anything else about the intellectual world in, in which they lived that we should address? It was a revolutionary world. They, in fact, Considering when they were born, they really were children of the revolution. <coughs> the classes from which they came were not normally those uh, that contributed large numbers of professional officers to their countries. Uh, in one respect, Germany uh, could be regarded as, uh, as an opportunist, a thruster, and a professional revolutionist were it not for his, his compulsion uh, throughout his whole life to attain uh, a status of, uh, of high substance in the uh, regimes that he served. And in the latter part of his life, it didn't matter much which regime he served so long as he served it well. He liked but to play the free agency Field. He was very much the free agent. And this was not, uh, uh, lest your students be misled by his jumping from one side to another after 1813, which I think John Shy explains very well in his essay, uh, this was not at all uh, an, uncommon, uh, an uncommon act for a, uh, a lifelong soldier uh, to jump from one, uh, from one master to another. Uh, that too, I think, is a, uh, is a oh, an element of military professionalism. So long as you do your job well and professionally, it doesn't much matter uh, who you do it for, as long as you do it well. I think that the thing that's interesting is all the dramatic changes that are taking place, not only in the intellectual field, but if you look at the French Revolution and the nature of politics, uh, economic development is taking place. And for guys like Germany and Clausewitz, you have now the emergence of a master, a new master on the battlefield, who has to be interpreted, has to be understood. Germany uh, latches himself onto the French army, and he is probably more optimistic. He's trying to explain success. He's under the aura of, of the success of Napoleon. And what's the keys to him? And he sees a system, because each individual has a system 
a pattern of behavior, and he's trying to capture that, and using Frederick the Great too as another example to help him to understand Napoleon. On the other side, you'll see Clausewitz, who has to face this dreaded individual who's wrecking havoc throughout Europe, and he suffers defeat. So I think those are important events in these both these people's lives that shape how they approach the era around them. I'm doing everything I can not to uh, jump into Clausewitz, right? Not to jump into Clausewitz, but as, as you can see just from our, our discussions, it's virtually impossible not to compare the two. Uh, Roger has introduced uh, the idea of important influences upon Germany and Germany's personality, which should be addressed. Uh, three of us have already agreed that we do not want to go over factual material that's already in your, in your readings. Uh, but at this point, you might want to compare the personalities and the experiences of, t of these two theorists uh, and see what, how, how much mileage you can get out of that. Gentlemen? I agree. I agree. There are two very, very different men. You shouldn't, <clears throat> you shouldn't be misled, and you shouldn't allow your students to be misled in thinking that just because they're, both of these men are, are roughly classified as theorists, uh, because they had the effect that they did, uh, because they were both uh, and born at the same time, born at the same time, shaped by the French Revolution, shaped by the same uh, continental uh, influences, uh, that they are the same men. They are very different, very different kinds of men. Um, I mentioned a moment ago that, that Germany was something of an opportunist. Uh, I didn't mean that necessarily in, uh, in a pejorative uh, way. Uh, opportunism is also something new. One of the features of warfare at the, uh, at the turn of the century in the Napoleonic era uh, is that it includes vastly greater numbers of people than warfare ever had before, in the West at least. And also the upheavals of society meant that the opportunities for social mobility were that much greater. The opportunities being there, opportunists, opportunists will be found to take them. Um, Karl von Clausewitz is much different, much different uh, in that respect. He may be uh, interested in his own uh, in his own personal goals. He does certainly want to attain something individually, intellectually, and professionally. Uh, but at the same time, he does it within, I think, a much more restricted ambit than does Germany. Germany seems to know no border and no preference for a master, whereas Clausewitz, for all his uh, intellectual adventurousness, and nevertheless uh, spends his entire life in, in the service of the Prussian state and king. Um, of course, how he's regarded during that uh, has its ups and its downs, but it's still within the service of, service of the king. So these are two very different men, two very different minds uh, looking at essentially the same phenomenon. And you uh, can really exercise your students. Each will leave the service. Each will leave the service, Army. yes. Uh, and for different reasons. You might want to bring that up uh, in front of your students. Yeah, what were those reasons? Those, those different reasons alone uh, lead you into, uh, um, uh, could lead you into a very good discussion of comparison between the two men. Very good. The one thing that struck me about if you compare the two, Jomini forms a lot of his ideas early on and then just refines them. If you look at Clausewitz, uh, he dies still trying to revise a major work. He's concerned about discovery of truth, self-enlightenment, and then the spin-off of that for others. So you have to admire his dedication just to understand, whereas I think Jomini was more in terms of action and getting his ideas across to people and making sure that he benefits from that. He's not willing to sit in the basement and discover truth toward the end of his career. He's still working on being known. Let's go, let's go ahead and jump ahead and look at uh, some of the key ideas of uh, Germany and uh, their significance to us. Um, I think if Germany were here with us today, he would say, my ideas on warfare are true and they are simple, that one should hurl mass along a line of operation towards 
an object which the enemy holds dearly. And he would call that the center of gravity or a decisive point. Um, and that this offensive action should provide uh, provide all the circumstances for victory. End of subject. Gosh, that is awfully simple, isn't it? <clears throat> is there any truth to it? Jomini's been accused of being the ultimate reductionist that he takes the exceedingly complex subject of war and boils it down uh, to the simple statement of uh, uh, hurling your mass upon a decisive point, uh, overwhelming uh, fractions of the enemy. Um, this is extremely appealing, extremely appealing to an audience that is to say, those who uh, spend their lives in and thinking about war, but who haven't gotten to Germany's point yet, it, it simplifies <clears throat> beyond all measure um, and takes the mystery, essentially re removes the mystery uh, from war, removes the mystery from, uh, from Napoleonic War, how Napoleon did what he did. And he has a special way of getting around uh, Napoleon, whom everyone seems to agree, even after Waterloo in 1815, uh, was at least, uh, if not a political, certainly a military uh, genius. And that is how he, uh, that is how he gets around uh, the problem of Napoleonic War. So he separates the genius of war from the technique of war. And he simplifies it, boils it down to its, uh, its, its, its simplest possible uh, uh, factors. And uh, even as late as the American Civil War, uh, American generals were, uh, were repeating this, even if they had not read any of Germany's works, were repeating uh, this uh, falling by masses uh, through decisive, upon decisive points uh, uh, by greater fractions than those possessed by the enemy, uh, as almost as if it was a mantra as if it were the key to success, the magic button. And the one thing, if you left everything else out, that you had to do in order to win. <clears throat> extremely appealing, extremely appealing. And it counts, I think, uh, a great deal for Germany's popularity throughout the 19th century, and even down to the present day. If you pick up FM 100-5, some of the earlier editions, certainly, you'll see that a lot of military operations, the requirements, are reduced down to lists, checklists. Uh, and everybody is looking uh, still to this day for the magic button. <coughs> it's, uh, it's a search that will probably go on forever. Um, Germany believed that his insight was just that, uh, that he had thought of this as early as 1798. Um, and then he lived for a very long time, to the age of 90. He doesn't die until 1869, so longevity has a lot to do with it. You spend a long life defending your original position. One of the things you better ask your students, <clears throat> or at least challenge your students about, is how legitimate can Germany's ideas be if they all derive from a flash of insight? without any study or reflection or precious little of it. How legitimate is this idea? Even though he's managed, uh, he's a very clever fellow, very intelligent and also industrious fellow, he's managed for the rest of 60 years of his life to defend his positions. Uh, how legitimate is it? Uh, is that the way you would do it today? Is that the way we would do it today? Clausus doesn't do it that way. He does it precisely the opposite way. And there's another great difference between the two. One is inductive, and the other is deductive. Uh, how, how are we to understand the pervasiveness of Germany's thought in the 19th century, in spite of all this? I think one thing is he focused on trying to be practical, 
giving some insights into what you need to win on the battlefield, which appeal to officers. He's geared, I think, toward commanders in what he's writing about. How do you win on the battlefield? You win by massing. And how do you mass? He'll explain a little bit of that. Uh, say it's not that easy then to figure out what you're going to do with the mass. Then he says, well, you can go either right, left, or down the middle. It's not that complicated. And by writing about it, the profession, simplifying into a, more of a science, he gives it credibility. He makes it an, an intellectual endeavor, a scientific endeavor, which is appealing to officers because they're living in a scientific era. And it makes them feel more as professionals. They could say, we're professionals like other professions because of this knowledge that Germany is uh, giving us that's of a scientific nature and it uh, is simplified. I think one of the things that one could keep in mind for those who like this idea of principles of war is that... In fact, what, we owe the principles of war to... Germany. To Germany. Okay. Is that uh, when you come to low, what we call low-intensity conflict, uh, revolutionary wars, wars like in Spain, he's, he feels very uncomfortable with this principle. And he says, well, it really doesn't apply well. So that already gives you an idea that by his reductionism, he, real, he, he does realize a bit the limitations of that across the spectrum of conflict. I think you're also suggesting that he knows his audience. Rogers already alluded to the, to the idea that he wanted to take Napoleon and politics out of warfare, out of this 20 years of war. In a sense, he reflects the values of his audience, the newly emerging professional officer class. Uh, guerrilla war, what does he have to say about that? Well, it exists. I hope you don't have to, ever have to fight it because, well, gentlemen really don't do that sort of thing. It's a guerrilla war is also not, <coughs> Clausewitz talks about this in some respect too, and, and reaches something like the same conclusion, although there's some discussion uh, on the business of what is called people's war in those days. Um, when Germany uh, spoke of people's war, um, he seemed to approach it in such a way that this, well, this was a very unpleasant business, it was, but it was not the sort of thing a gentleman participated in, certainly not a gentleman soldier. It was beneath, really, soldierly operations and had more to do with, uh, with police activity than with uh, classical orthodox military operations. He, he, he tried to make it sound as though it was really beneath soldiers, but with the experience of Napoleon's Peninsula campaign behind him, uh, he could hardly do that. So the most that he could say was simply that it was uh, something to be avoided at all costs. He, he never even uh, tried to imply that he understood people's war. Um, Clausewitz approached the uh, People's War in much the same way. Not in a dismissive way. He simply admitted that he didn't much understand it. And there's some reason to think that when Clausewitz was talking about People's War, he was not only referring to the Peninsular Campaign um, uh, of Napoleon, but also uh, to discussions held inside Prussia uh, at the time, uh, essentially after, uh, after the defeat of Prussia at Vienna Arstadt, uh, to the idea of a popular uprising inside uh, inside the uh, German states. Uh, this is a point not yet proved, not completely researched, but uh, so he had a he had a slightly more expansive view of, uh, of people's war than uh, than, uh, than Germany did. In both cases, people's war seemed to represent to these theorists the absence of reason in the conduct of war. Reason is uh, an element that is critical to both of these theorists, even though they deal with it in quite a different way. War to them, <clears throat> the highest expression of war was war as an expression of reason, man's reason, the application of intelligence uh, to the, uh, the conduct of war uh, in the service of the state. Today there is a uh, debate raging within uh, intellectual circles about the nature of, of theory <coughs> and the divergence between theory that simplifies and reduces phenomena as opposed to theory that allows for greater and greater degrees of complexity.
this realm, Carl, uh, Carl von Clausewitz is obviously far more of a complex thinker than Germany. Uh, we've already introduced a number of ideas about uh, Carl von Clausewitz and his works. Uh, background, the intellectual world in which he lived, not that much different from Germany. His experience, however, and his personality would seem to differ considerably. And uh, I would suggest looking in, uh, into that a good deal in classroom discussion. Um, Germany always needs a shield, a general to protect him, to look after his interests. Um, his shields weren't that reliable and weren't that good, however. No. no. Germany's patron, <coughs> most famous patron, is, uh, well, I should say his first and most famous patron uh, uh, would be Marshal Ney, who had read, uh, who had read one of Germany's early pieces and eventually took him on to his staff as a, uh, what was then called a gentleman volunteer, which means that simply that he had the, had a presumptive rank of a staff officer, uh, but of course could not command, uh, certainly could not command uh, French or auxiliary troops. This was roughly a kind of betwixt and between status for Germany, who always thirsted after, or at least thought he thirsted after the uh, uh, the role of the commander. He never did. Uh, he never did command troops in battle. Then Napoleon took him up. Uh, Germany himself is the best source uh, for this, and uh, and in several conversations, of course, with Napoleon, uh, according to Germany, Germany always comes out on the better end of the two, as at least the superior thinker of war. Uh, you may regard these stories with a good deal of uh, <clears throat> suspicion, because among other things, because of his ambiguous status in all the armies in which he served, Germany might be best thought of as a fellow who earned his living with his pen. And he was prodigious. 34 books? I believe so. 34 books in all in the course of his life. Uh, some of them uh, bearing a suspicious resemblance to other books that he had written. And in, 19, in 1838, he goes so far as to reduce everything he's written to a précis, a summary of the art of war, which becomes perhaps the best-selling military uh, theoretical textbook in the 19th century. He does this uh, with the express purpose of uh, of uh, increasing his bank balance, uh, not necessarily to advance the state of military knowledge. Well, he has, you know. he has to write for a living. He has to write for a living. Whereas Clausewitz does not. Right. Uh, many of my students like to dismiss Germany, uh, well, I'll use their words, as a, a cowardly staff puke. <laughs> Any truth to this? No, there's no. <coughs> he, in the few opportunities he had to, uh, he had to show uh, or to demonstrate his courage, his presence of mind on the battlefield. Uh, he was not found one. He was, uh, he was at several, especially uh, severe battles. Uh, uh, particularly, he was with Marshal Ney at the Battle of Botzen in, in 1813, and uh, and was uh, pretty far up front. Um, uh, Germany has had a bad press from one part of the professional community even while he was alive. Napoleon's chief of staff, Marshal Berthier, uh, hated Germany's guts and did everything he could to foil uh, the advance of Germany in the affections of the emperor and indeed uh, in the advancement uh, in rank. It's one of the reasons Germany uh, decamped after uh, the Battle of Botzen in, uh, in 1813 and went over to the Russian side in the service of the Tsar. Uh, where he remained for the uh, for the rest of his life in various uh, guises and, and statuses. One thought that crosses my mind as I listen to both of you in comparing Germany and Clausewitz is that Germany is with Napoleon who is successful. He's often with people who are acting. Whereas Clausewitz gets in with a circle of people who are very contemplative as well as actors. Scharnhorst, a bright intellectual mind. Uh, a resume that he brings with him to Prussia that has him as editor of a journal. And the thing I think you could ask yourself and officers you're with when you're talking about this subject is, how much is the military profession a thinking profession? How much is it just tell me what to do, just give me the mission statement, just give me a few techniques on how to fight on the battle 
yourself feel, well, how much is the mind involved? And I think for Clausewitz, he's trying to get people to think. And his theory is designed to be systematic in helping you to go through this complexity of called war, this challenge of war, this frightening animal called war, and to be able to weave and think through that on your own and reach some enlightenment as you go along. Jaumani is trying to reach a profession that's very busy, doesn't have time to think, and trying to reduce things that uh, make some sense and give you some confidence as you go in. But again, he understands that there are limitations when he's pushed against the wall. And I think one thing you could ask is, how much is the intellect important in the profession? How much is it important to find time to reflect about the profession, think about what it means as you prepare to act? There's an, there's an important point in there, George. One is that, and, and it's another key difference between these two theorists, Jomini was not part of a circle. He had no way to test his ideas. He considered no one his equal in military thought. He gave no one credit for any good ideas but himself. He was an essentially uh, a self-taught military theorist, an autodidact. And an outsider. And an outsider, perpetually an outsider. Uh, a Swiss, first in the service of the French, and then in the service of the Tsar, and then he ends his life in, back in Paris. Uh, Clausewitz, on the other hand, uh, came up by his, uh, by his native intelligence and talent, uh, had the fortune, the good fortune, of being adopted by people who saw his intellectual qualities, and just at the right time, when he, when he achieved his maturity, had done his, his regimental duties as a junior officer and cadet, he has the good fortune to become involved in a military salon a circle of military students of very high rank down to intermediate rank, whose stated objective was to discuss, examine, and understand the great military problems facing Russia, Prussia of the time. It, from a very early age, it was his business to do this. And in this business, he was supported by a group of like-minded officers, or if, me, if not like-minded. Even, even ministers even outside ministers, of the military were involved in that war. society. And this was a decidedly liberal group within the confines, the, the, the restricted confines of Prussian politics at the time. Uh, so uh, within, the, uh, within the Prussian army, uh, Clausewitz and his, uh, and his uh, confederates in, in that famous uh, uh, military salon, the, uh, the Militärische Gesellschaft, mm -hmm. um, was looked upon as something of a raving liberal. The other thing about this salon was that today, the, the, uh, a lot of my students <coughs> immediately uh, stereotype this group of officers in this, uh, in this military circle as uh, a bunch of uh, pointy-headed intellectuals who would never get their boots dirty at all. Nothing could be further from the truth. Those men who were members of this military salon were men of wide and direct experience from their earliest youth as indeed was Clausewitz himself. I believe he saw combat at the age of 12. 12. At the age of 12, his first combat. And his, his confederates in this military salon were men very much of, the, of that kind. They saw no disjuncture between a thinking soldier and an acting soldier. And this is something relatively new in military history. Correct me if I'm wrong, but let's say you had a major problem of an enemy with a very good army led by a very good commander. And you ask the question, well, how are we going to solve the problem of defeating him? If you go to Germany, he'll probably think of what can the military profession change? How can you change the army, train it, educate its, its commanders to beat this guy in the battlefield? You go to Clausewitz, he would look at, well, what about the political side of things? What about the economic side of things? We can't just look at military subjects. And that's what made them so revolutionary, because they realized that to fight Napoleon, you had to create a government of the people, for the people, and not just fight the old army of the Prussian kings. You had to create a national army. You had to give a reason for these people to want to fight other than just pay and discipline. Yeah. I would, uh, I would like to uh, devote some time to Clausewitz's key ideas and the strengths or weaknesses that uh, 
its work <coughs> might have. Any thoughts there? Uh, I, I I think this, uh, in my view, uh, the uh, certainly the best known. Uh, most widely uh, quoted of, of Clausius's idea is his definition of uh, the relationship between war and policy. The word policy has given interpreters of Clausewitz no end of trouble, especially among Americans. Uh, sometimes this word also in German, it can mean either policy or politics. Among Americans, when you mention the word politics, there's an almost Pavlovian reaction, and it is not a favorable one. So I would suggest when you're talking to your students about this connection between uh, war and politics that you employ the word policy. Uh, most of the instances in the original German text where this term is used, policy is the, is the translation you come out with in English, and not politics as an American might use it. Uh, he simply said that war is is a political instrument that is a continuation of politics by other means. And uh, he elaborates upon that definition in several different ways that are very important to the subsequent development of his theory. And, but uh, Americans in particular, and even in the present day, I think, uh, have a great deal of difficulty uh, coming to grips with the notion that military action must always be subordinated to the dictates of policy. And that if it is not, what you essentially have is violence without reason, war that is not animated by a, uh, a guiding objective. In other words, insensate violence to no purpose at all. It's policy that gives purpose to war. That, I think, is the single most uh, important uh, and certainly best known idea in Clausewitz's writing. And I think there is always the danger to say just identify the political objectives and let the army go. And this is not what Clausewitz is saying because it's a dynamic relationship and policy changes as the war progresses. You have to make decisions. For example, it's a policy decision. How much do you mobilize the society? Do you go guns and butter or do you do a total mobilization? Sometimes a total mobilization is a decision made in war. If you're fighting a short war like against Iraq, the policy decision decision is made, we cannot allow Israel to get involved in the war. We have to divert valuable military resources to prevent Iraq from hitting Israel. Schwarzkopf would rather have those assets to go directly against the Iraqis and, and protect our soldiers by putting more ordnance on the Iraqis. But for political reasons, we cannot allow the coalition to break apart because that could hurt our conduct of the war. Policy decision is made. We need to assign aircraft, and Patriot missile batteries to help Israel protect itself without having to get involved by itself. So it's a dynamic relationship, and in policy, it means decisions made that how you use force throughout the war. It involves diplomacy as well, because you want diplomacy to be conducted in the conduct of war as well. All right, that's an excellent point. The, um, the dynamic relationship you speak of between politics and war, um, is a relationship that typifies all of Clausewitz's theory. Whereas Germany attempts to freeze war in its place, to paint a single dimension picture of it, as though once you learn it, you have to learn no more, war will never change. As long as you get the basic rules and principles down, You've got it, and no it's problem. Inherently simple, and it's inherently simple. And every war is the same way. In Clausewitz, dynamism is the key. Under Clausewitzian theory, uh, one of the most remarkable things about this theory is that it allows war to continue to move. It insists that war is protean in nature, that it will always change, and it will always challenge even the highest level of intelligence uh, in keeping it in check, that is to say, within the bounds of reason or policy. That's what, that's what, uh, what another uh, very great uh, difference between Germany and Clausewitz. Germany freezes war uh, 
Clausewitz insists that war moves. It's very difficult to construct a theory, uh, that is to say, to keep the phenomenon at least uh, under check long enough so that you can paint a picture of it and still allow it to move. It's very difficult. And not many, uh, I'd be hard pressed to name a theorist since then who's been able to pull off this hat trick. But Clausewitz does it uh, in the way he constructs his theoretical system. And in a way, I think if you look at, for example, the Vietnam War from a Germanian or Clausewitzian point of view, Germany might ask, well, what was the, what were the political objectives at the beginning? Did we have them? And did we strive to attain them? Yeah. Clausewitz would say, well, you start out with certain objectives. The dynamic of the war changes. The enemy forces you to adapt. So you critique the changes that you make in strategy and employment of tactics throughout the war. Were they the best given the new situation as it's evolving? Rather than go back to the origins and say, well, if you didn't start out right, you blew it. Clausewitz also introduced the idea of friction. What is the significance of friction? It's an essential element of the dynamism George was speaking of. If you insist that war is always moving, movement always creates friction. He described as part of the atmosphere of war, not only friction, but physical exertion, danger, and military intelligence. Those four things put together compose the world in which war exists. And on top of this, something that, that George mentioned a moment ago, this interactivity, this constant interactivity between the two sides, at least two sides of war, creates uh, a tendency of wars constantly to escalate, to exert to the exertion of more and more force. Now, theoretically, Theoretically, this doctrine of extremes could take you to a point that Clausewitz called absolute war. Absolute war. Can there ever be such a thing as no. absolute war? No. No? And why not? Because of friction. Friction operates, <coughs> I think someone, uh, someone uh, say an electrician would say that friction works as impedance works. It prevents, uh, it prevents uh, uh, an escalation to absolute extremes. So why do you throw it in there? He threw it in there, he threw the whole idea of absolute war into his, uh, into his theory. It's, uh, it's, an old, uh, it's an old trick of uh, philosophers uh, all the way back to Plato. You imagine the perfect thing so that you can describe the real thing. Okay, so we're not dealing with an ordinary, an ordinary thinker here with Clausewitz. We're dealing with uh, someone who does handle complexity. Army writing manual and the army writing style, we're supposed to start off with the leading edge up front and state your thesis. Germanian. Clausewitz isn't like that, is he? No. He will start off with a case, a thesis, let's say. Yes. Look at it and say that's not quite right. Then he'll move on to something that may be better, which he'll call the antithesis. Examine it, see its strengths, then look at its weaknesses and say, no, that's not quite right. And yet, come up with the third point where he wants to be the synthesis, and that and again returns to George's point of the dynamic, right. a dynamic not only in war but a dynamic in the thought process. So when we re read Clause events, we should not stop with that first idea that he introduces. Certainly not. He's testing himself out loud. His whole book, in a way, is a, is a testing out loud. In, in my view, in no other theorist is the connection between the structure of his work and the content of his work so intimately related. At the beginning of, of uh, Clausewitz's uh, great work on war, he says that most of this is just a shapeless mass of ideas. I haven't decided yet how I'm going to end up with this theory. I'm really dissatisfied with this. I'm going to do this all over again. It looks as though scholars who've examined the manuscripts very closely have concluded that Clausewitz wrote his way all the way from book one through book eight and then started over again and got just about through, what, book one mm -hmm. when he died. 
So if you want to look at the part of the book that most satisfies Clausewitz, you look at books one and book eight. Uh, books four, five, six, and seven are best regarded as case studies or cases in point in which he tests the ideas that he's laid down in the first three books. So the structure of this book, the, the way in which he wrote this book, is a key to interpreting what is in the book and what parts of the book to take most seriously and what parts of the book uh, to approach with a degree at least of caution. Absolutely right. The one thing that strikes me too about Clausewitz going back to friction, uh, we often uh, have slogans in the army and we don't really think about the implications of them. And it goes back to that uh, combat at the age of 12. One thing that strikes me about Clausewitz is the individual soldier matters. He has in his theory a place for what happens with individual soldiers in that chapter on danger. Danger discusses the first combat that a soldier experiences, the fear. Marching into battle and seeing the officers around you starting to duck, because they've got experience of combat before. That forms part of the friction. It's not a friction at the political level or at the operational level that's oh, important. Oh, it can be there. Yeah, it's everywhere, right. throughout the whole system at all levels. And here, he's dealing with politics, what is war, but yet he comes back down to the soldier at the point of the arrow at the, what the cutting of the blade right. and that's also very important in him and you ask yourself do you control that environment President Clinton should think, when he commits people into Bosnia, when the shooting starts, what is happening at that point of the arrow? Can he control that environment, or is he going to have to react to when the shooting starts? Clausewitz is, is often accused of being a cold fish, the archetypical, passionless uh, commentator on uh, the philosophy of war. In my judgment, nothing could be further from the truth. And the chapter, um, the chapter in, in book one, I believe, on danger and war, uh, is as good an argument against that interpretation as any I can think of. There's a passage in that chapter after he describes the young soldier, and I think he's describing himself in exactly. his first combat. I think so too. Yep. He talks about when he finally reaches when he finally reaches the firing line. There's a there's a passage there that I think is significant to him personally, but also to his general theory. He says, here, on the firing line, here the light of reason is refracted in a manner which is altogether different from that which is normal in academic speculation. Exactly. To say, when you are thinking about war, you must think about things like friction, things not happening on time, physical exertion, danger. These things are not normal subjects for and academic speculation. War escaping human control. War escaping reason. And escaping reason. Yep. And uh, bloodless operations. Right. No such thing. Right. Well, we have already introduced two elements of the paradoxical trinity, and you just mentioned the third element of the paradoxical trinity, violence. He says that war is inherently violent. Should we, is he belaboring the obvious there? No, I don't think so because uh, people who are not familiar with soldiering are sometimes surprised that there's death and destruction when soldiers are committed. Uh, generals strive sometimes to win quickly, decisively, with few casualties, and then when the fighting starts and people are being killed left and right, they're shocked by it. People don't come to grips with what really soldiering is about. Ultimately, is to use weapons in violence to kill and be killed. And if that's the essence of war, and it's true, why is it we so often talk about war on the streets, war against poverty, all these kinds of different notions we have of war? But for the profession of arms, I think you have to ask yourself, what is really my profession about? And it's ultimately when people see people in uniform with weapons, which is what soldiers have, it's to wage war. And then what is war? How much is death and destruction there? How much can you control that environment? Because it shapes how you prepare leaders, how you prepare soldiers to fight. Do you give them easy solutions and expect them to work, or do you give them a clear understanding of what they're gonna face when they have their first shots thrown at them, and how they're gonna have to uh, 
weave their way through. So I think the question of what is war is an essential one because it shapes how you look at your profession, how you prepare for it, what kind of vibe you send to people around you, and people underneath you, how you prepare them mentally for it. It's, a, it's important to remember, too, that military practice, the practice of warfare, has just passed through a period in which professional soldiers, uh, such as the Marshal de Saxe, profess to be able to live out his entire career without ever fighting a battle, simply to win wars by, by virtue of maneuver. Um, an approach to war that some of our generals during the American Civil War was accused of, notably George B. McClellan, among others. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, great on maneuver, not too much on uh, coming to grips on the battlefield. Um, of course, we could not uh, we could not have fought out our civil war in, in, in such a way. But this uh, this idea has a very long tradition, at least uh, running back a uh, hundred years before uh, the Battle of Waterloo was fought. Uh, so certainly since the uh, the early 1700s, the military historians usually refer to this as the Great Age of Limited War. The war limited in how uh, limited in what ways, limited in their political objectives certainly, but also limited in their methods, limited finally in the result of those wars, uh, leading many people to believe, well, if the shelf life of victory is so short, why the hell should we fight the war to begin with? What's the good in it? And this is certainly a question that the masses of Western Europe were beginning to ask themselves. Why should we, why should we uh, uh, devote or donate our bodies uh, to battles that mean nothing at all as far as our welfare is concerned? So, so we come back to this, to this notion of the revolution. It's a revolution in warfare, certainly, that these two men are trying to explain. And it's also a revolution in society. But in your subsequent lessons, you will hear a lot about the military revolution of the 19th century. And what is usually, ref what is usually meant by that is the technical revolution, the advent of rifled weaponry and how that changed the shape of the battlefield. That's certainly true, and there's no need to denigrate that idea at all. But you must always keep in mind that it was, that it was accompanied by a revolution even greater in extent and longer lasting than that technical revolution, and that is the democratic revolution. So the democratic and the technical revolution were the twin revolutions that these two men were attempting uh, to make sense out of uh, during this period. Gentlemen, any remarks regarding misconceptions regarding uh, either one or both of these theorists? One for uh, Clausewitz, I think you mentioned it, Roger, is that he's a warmonger, advocates total war. Right. Uh, that's far from the truth. Uh, absolute war is something you can never attain. It's an intellectual device that he uses, and, he's, and it, it's an intellectual device that makes sense. He said, the farther you move away from abs approaching absolute war, the more the war will seem political. The closer you get to absolute war, the more you'll see the military and the political working together, and then more it will seem the military will be the most important. But it's an intellectual construct to help you to go through the spectrum of war. But you can never attain absolute war. He doesn't advocate using all force uh, for the word go, because right. he knows it's natural to have constraints, social constraints, political constraints. He's not an advocate of total war. He even sees war solves very little. Often what happens is the person who's defeated will just find ways to work against you for the next conflict. Right. There's one idea that we haven't discussed, and it's it's been the origin of a great deal of discussion in, in uh, military theoretical circles for the past uh, oh, seven or eight years. And that has to do with the continued relevance of Clausewitz, uh, particularly with regard to what he called, uh, and it's been translated as the paradoxical trinity. Uh, some people translate this as the strange trinity, simply meaning that it's unusual. Um, both your essays on Germany and Clausewitz uh, address uh, the paradoxical trinity, which uh, uh, you should not let your students get out of the room uh, if they go out of the room saying that the trinity consists of the army, state, and nation. That is certainly not true. Uh, you need to look very closely at the passages in, uh, in uh, the Paré essay on Clausewitz uh, to see just what this trinity was. You'll see a lot of people, uh, even who are in the business of theorizing today, questioning whether or not the trinity can any longer contain the modern permutations of present-day conflict. 
So that's still an idea very much in the, up in the air. The, so the great misconception of Clausewitz and Germany too may be that we've outgrown theory, we have not, or alternatively, that we've outgrown these particular theories. Well, that may be a question for your uh, class to answer, not for us. Very good. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I would like to say one or two brief words about this lesson. Um, the first time I had to teach this lesson seven or eight years ago, I, uh, I faced it with trepidation as an enemy of, of uh, theory in general. Uh, over the years, uh, most of that trepidation has uh, slipped away. Try to have some fun with the lesson. Uh, don't be terrified of it. There are indeed many different theorists and many different theories. We should learn to deal with them. Thank you for joining us. Doctors, thank you.